As we go into God's word together, this is my prayer for us. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once you see the, uh, the gospel lesson for this morning, you understand why the Old Testament lesson is there. The story about Nathan, Nathan the prophet coming to confront a hero of the faith, certainly a man that we'd think, especially as we go through Sunday school, could, could pull his shirt open and have a big S on his face. It would be David, right? On his chest. David. This is David. This is the one who slays Goliath. This is the one, the young boy, who says to all the adults, why are you afraid of this giant? If God is on our side, we can take on Goliath. And he does. He gets his little slingshot out and he takes the guy down by the power and the work of God. This is David. This is the one who, who is the shepherd, who, who writes the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. I I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. This is David. This is King David, the king of all kings in the time of, uh, uh, of the people of Old Testament, the, the one that they always talk about. This is David, the one that God calls a man after his own heart, who's a murderer and an adulterer. You know, people outside of Christianity will look at the Bible and say, why in the world would you talk about a man who murders someone and who commits adultery. Why in the world would you put that in your Bible? Why don't you leave that story out? That's kind of a skeleton in your closet, isn't it? Let's leave that one out. Let's so talk about that. But yet the scriptures tell us about people who like us are real people. Real people who are sinners, who, who, who fall, who, who at times shine in our faith, but other times fall flat on our faces. And I have to admit, like we did at the beginning of the worship service, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, you know, and that I can't stand on my own. I am trusting who? I am trusting you, Lord Jesus. Well, come to the gospel lesson for today, because Jesus is going to teach us a lesson about forgiveness, not only forgiveness for other people, but forgiveness for me as well. It starts out with an invitation. If you want to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, beginning at thir verse 36, it goes like this. It says, now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now put on your thinking caps a little bit because Jesus gets invitations from time to time, doesn't he? There, there's times when the Pharisees invite Jesus to come to, to there and Jesus goes. There's other times when people like tax collectors and sinners invite Jesus to come to their home. And what does Jesus do? He goes. The famous Zacchaeus, right? The wee little man, right? Who's up in a tree to be able to see Jesus. When he, when he sees Jesus go by, uh, Jesus says to him, I'm coming to your house today, right? Matthew, the tax collector, who, who when Jesus calls him in his place, invites Jesus to come to his home, makes promises to Jesus. Jesus doesn't turn down invitations. Whether it's a Pharisee, whether it's a tax collector, a sinner, whoever it is, Jesus accepts invitations. Even though he knows what he's going to get when he goes to the house of the Pharisee, he knows he's going to get the grumbling in the background, people not saying to him what they're thinking in their mind, although he knows what they're thinking. Or it's a tax collector or a sinner, and he knows that when he goes there, the people outside are going to be talking about, look at who he's with. Jesus accepts invitations. He accepts your invitation too. He says, come to me no matter what it is. Come to me with all of your struggles, your challenges, your hardships. Come to me. He says, pray to me at all times. Invitation he gives to us. There's nothing so small. There's nothing insignificant that he does invite us to come to him. He's an inviting kind of savior. So come. And here is the invitation. Don't think it's too trivial. It doesn't make as big a difference or, or someone else has a bigger problem than mine or a bigger situation. No, he invites us to come and he accepts. He accepts our invitations when we say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need your strength. Lord, I need you to come to me. Maybe that's the position you're in right now in your life. And you're thinking, wow, can I really bring this to God? Can I come to him with this? Is it, is it too small a thing? And Jesus good news accepts invitations. But it goes on to say, when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, look at that. Jesus is invited. This woman is not invited. She's a party crasher, right? Isn't that what it is? Think of it in all the terms of what that means. She crashes this party. No invitation there. She goes to this party because she hears 
that Jesus is there. She's an uninvited guest, at least by the host. You've had uninvited guests into your life. Just found out that a classmate of mine from high school, her husband just found out that he has an uninvited guest. It's called cancer. And he's just found out that he has cancer now, an uninvited guest. He didn't want this. They didn't want this in their life. They didn't ask for it, but it's there. And now they have to deal with cancer and all that it means and the testing and the, and the treatments and stuff like that. That uninvited guest is there. We're all dealing with uninvited guests in our lives, whether it's a loss of a job, whether it's some other diagnosis by a doctor, whether it's trouble or hardship that's coming upon your life, whether it's the shingles on your house that need to be replaced, whether it's whatever it is in your life, it's an uninvited guest. The news that you heard this morning in Orlando was an uninvited guest and you had nothing you could do about it, but yet it's there in front of you. But Jesus comes even into the midst of that. And he is there with us in the midst of all those uninvited guests of our lives. He comes even to David, who didn't invite him to come, who wanted to have his sin just totally be covered up and forget about and just go on with his life. His uninvited guest was a guy by the name of Nathan the prophet, who came to him and said, David, this is not right. You've been separated from God. He needed that uninvited guest. And fortunately, God loved David so much that he sent him that uninvited guest to come into his life so that he could see his sin and he could be drawn back and put back into a right relationship with God. And fortunately, David receives that uninvited guest by faith and admits, I'm the man. I'm the man. And I plead to you, God, for mercy. And so this uninvited guest shows up at the party. And it says, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, understand this, kind of like, well, the picture that you see of, of Jesus with his disciples at the, Lord, at the Last Supper is not real factual in many ways because when they came to a meal, they would be more lying down, kind of on a shoulder on a, or on an elbow lying down with their feet behind them. So that's the picture of this woman coming in. And she comes in and she comes to Jesus' feet. It says, as she stood behind him at his feet, she was weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So imagine this picture, okay? So you've thrown this party. Let's say you're Simon. You've thrown this party. You've invited Jesus to come to be there, and he's accepted your invitation, and he's there. And then comes this uninvited guest that everyone knows about her. Well, it says this. It says, when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was there. And you almost have to ask, I wonder which woman it was. Because if we're going to be honest with ourselves, there's not a single woman or man who hasn't lived a sinful life, who hasn't heard the invitation of God and has come. Every single one of us sit here as a sinful person. And we've heard the invitation of God, and therefore we've come. Which sinful woman are we talking about here? Which sinful man are we talking about? We've all confessed that. We said that in the words of the confession, that that I'm a sinner, that I've fallen short of the glory of God, and I'm coming at Christ's invitation. And that's what we need to do. But this singles out one. And imagine if you're Simon, the one who invited, invited Jesus to come, but didn't invite this woman. Now you've got this woman here, number one. And then secondly, what does she do? Well, she lets down her hair. Think about that. What that means today. When you let your hair down. When you show people who you really are. And this woman, knowing who Jesus is, is willing to do what? to let down her hair. Probably not just anybody that you can do that with, that you can admit everything about yourself, no pretenses, no false stuff in front. And that's what she does because she knows who this Jesus is. And she knows that she can let down her hair before him. Pastor Nathan and I tell you, and we say in the words of our ordination, we say that anything you divulge to us in the privacy of our office, we share with nobody. It's called confidentiality. It's called the the promise of ordination. But there's another one even greater than Pastor Nathan and myself that we can let down our hair with too. 
and be totally honest and confess our sins to him and confess the ugliness of our sin, like David, admit the thoughts that we have, admit the things that we've done that we can't let our hair down to anybody else, but yet with Jesus we can. In the words confession, that word confession literally means to say the same thing. In other words, when we confess our sins to God, God doesn't go, oh my gosh, I didn't know about that. But rather he says, now we're both on the same page. Because like with David, God knew what David did. But David had pushed it out of his mind until Nathan came to him. And then when David says, I have sinned, now he and God were back on the same page again. And that's a page that you want to be on with. That's a page that you want to be on the same page with, with God's page, admitting that we're sinners, but, it, but receiving from him the forgiveness that David received and the forgiveness that you received too. You see, when we confess our sins to God and get on that same page, then we get on the same page as Jesus Christ who was willing to be sin on our behalf, right? Who was willing to go to the cross and die on our behalf. And because of that, on that same page, we not only confess our sins, but we hear the wonderful words that you heard a moment ago because of what Christ did for you. Your sins are all forgiven. We get to hear words like the psalmist reminds us of, that God has separated us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. We get to hear words of the prophets saying, God saying to his people, I will forgive their sins and I will remember them no more. Those wonderful words. But that doesn't happen until we let our hair down, until we admit that to God, until we confess that to him and say who we are, and then we get to hear those incredible words. This is where she's at, right? Right? Now, I don't know about you, but it takes a lot for me to cry. Maybe it's kind of a guy thing. But I can tell you, I have never cried so hard that literally the tears were falling off of my face. Okay? Yesterday, I did an outside wedding at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And there was something falling off of my face. It was liquid of it. It was not tears. You know what I'm saying, right? It was sweat. But yet here's a woman who before Jesus is so distraught and realizes the gravity of what she's done in her life and also realizes the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And she is literally crying so much that the tears are coming off of her face enough to go onto the feet of Jesus that she can actually wipe his feet with those tears. And I guess it begs the question, do I recognize how much I've been forgiven, do I recognize and see the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ for me? So much that there are tears both of my own sorrow, recognizing what I have done, but also tears of joy, recognizing the great, incredible, unfathomable love of God for me. And that's true, right? We have been loved that way. We have been loved incredibly so. And, and that's not just love in the past. That's not just love in the future when we get to heaven. It's the same love that's there for us right now. That there's nothing that we go through in life that can separate us from that love and that we live in that love on a daily basis. But imagine Simon here having invited Jesus, but not inviting this woman. She's there at the feet of Jesus. She's let her hair down. She's weeping. They can hear her crying. She breaks out perfume. So now the whole house smells with this perfume. This perfume that she intends to be a a beautiful aroma to say thank you to Jesus for what you're going to do for me. This perfume that reminds us of our gifts to God too, in thanks to God for what he's given for us and in, 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 in all that he's, he's sacrificed on our behalf. And what's the response? Well, it says, verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And you know, every time when we get into a jam, it seems every time that we get into a jam, when life seems unfair to us, when things happen to us, we go where that Pharisee's at. And we begin to question God. If God really loved me, then 
why would this happen? If, if, if God really cared about me, then why am I going through what I'm in right now? And I'm here to tell you, as we always tell you, that anytime that comes up, Satan's lying. He's lying to you. The love of God and the grace of God has never changed and never will. You can always count upon it. The Pharisee questions whether Jesus really knows what's going on there. Kind of like we question sometimes too. God, do you really know what's going on here? God, are you really in charge? Are you really in control? Um, have, you, have you got things in the palm of your hand? Have you somehow fallen asleep or strayed? And the answer to all of those is absolutely not. That God can always be found where he's always been found. At the cross, at the empty tomb, ascending into heaven at the right hand of God. And he will never change or he will never move for you. And so we never have to question him. Oh, we will because we're weak. But we know the answer to that question. God, have you stopped loving me? No. God, did you not forgive me? No. God, are you not with me? Yes, you are with me always. And so Jesus said, he said to Simon, I have something to tell you. And Simon says to him, tell me, teacher. Now here's the thing. When Jesus tells stories, oftentimes he tells stories about money. Isn't that something? He knows how to get our attention, doesn't he? He knows how to get our attention. That thing that, that, that just grabs our attention so much. He says, there were two men who owed money to a certain money lender. Now here it's really getting home, right? This is someone that he owes something to. Sometimes I'm on the end of the owing one and someone, sometimes I'm on the end of the one that's being owed too, right? Gets my attention either way. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. Sound familiar? So he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them, Jesus asked, would love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You see, in some Protestant churches, when they pray the, the Lord's Prayer, they say this, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Not talking about money, but talking about that debt of forgiveness that debt of the price for that, that we owe, that has been forgiven. That has been forgiven because someone paid that price on our behalf. And that price for that debt of sin is something we can't possibly pay on our own. Paul brought it up again in our second lesson. But that debt has been paid for you by the blood of Jesus Christ. By his life, his death, his resurrection, he has paid for you. And what a wonderful message that is. That as I confess to God that I'm a sinner, he says, your sins have been paid for. You are forgiven totally, 100%. Simon, as he looked around and saw that woman who was a sinner, didn't realize that he was convicting himself too. Like David, he needed a Nathan to say to him, Simon, that's you too. And sometimes we need that too, don't we? It's easy, for us to, it's easy for us to look around and point out all the sinners that are out there and forget that I'm one of them as well. That by the grace of God and only by the grace of God do I stand before him, do I have any hope at all, and I do, I have the greatest hope at all of all in Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes to Simon and he says, you know what, Simon, <laughs> your etiquette isn't the best. I came and you didn't even greet me. You didn't offer to wash my feet. You didn't offer to give me oil to be anointed with. And yet this woman, the one that you're calling a sinner, was willing to do all three. And it kind of reminds you of another time, which makes good news out of this, where Jesus had invited some guests together and nobody thought about washing feet and welcoming. And you know what happened, right? Jesus himself puts a towel around his waist, grabs a bowl of water and goes and washes the feet of his disciples to show you and me that that's the kind of savior that we have. One who's willing to serve us, one who's willing to even stoop down and to wash the feet of us who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for us. This is your Jesus. This is your savior. And then to the woman, he turns to her and he says, your sins 
are forgiven. They're forgiven. In fact, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And that's the peace that we have, right? Not because of anything we've done, but because of what Christ has done for us. So that we can look around and see people in a totally different way. We can see every single person, no matter who it is, as someone that is loved by Jesus Christ, that Christ has died for, Christ has forgiven their sins, and that God loves. And that we have the opportunity, knowing that we've been forgiven, knowing that we are loved by God, to share that same love with them. And you do it. We're going to do it to the group that we're going to go up to Alaska as we meet people up there again, you do it every week through the food pantry. You do it in, in ways that you love and serve people around you. Maybe some that no one else will go around. And we're called to do that for the joy of knowing the forgiveness and the love of God that we have and the peace, the peace that is ours. So, Jesus accepts invitations. And he's there with you. And he lives and works through you. May you be that example of one to everybody in the world of how much you've been loved and you've been forgiven. And let that light shine in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's